Good morning. Welcome to 105 in this series. Um, I've been told that the correct pronunciation of this gentleman's name is Eugen Wigner. But I'm going to call him Eugene Wigner. <laughs> uh, he was one of the Martians. Remember, we spoke about that last time. <clears throat> the Hungarian scientists, um, a group of five or six of them, that um, did some remarkable things. And he'll be part of the lecture this morning, but what we're really going to talk about is, because of his work and where it led me in my research, the nature of reality. So that's going to be a large part of the, uh, the lecture this morning. He got the Nobel Prize in 1963 for uh, some of his work on the theory of the atomic nucleus and the application of symmetry, which we'll talk about a little bit in the uh, lecture as we go through it. So this outline, we should be out of here by 2, 2.30. Uh, you're gonna get a, you're gonna get a quite a mixture of stuff, but um, perhaps a, a better title instead of the nature of reality are impediments to the uh, determination of reality. Um, so we're gonna talk about relativity a little bit, uncertainty, the uncertainty principle, Heisenberg, uh, superposition theory, symmetry, entropy, noise, wave particle duality, a little bit about the quantum theory, objective observation, and then a little bit of philosophy, reality is information, and consideration of whether or not we are living in a computer simulation uh, being run by some advanced form of civilization, probably outside of the solar system, or even the universe, the origin of the universe. We'll talk about multiverses a little bit, and then uh, summarize. 2, 2.30, I think, yeah. Wigner, uh, or Wigner, depending on how you want to pronounce it, born in 1902, um, had, uh, two sisters, uh, one of whom married uh, Paul Dirac, who we've spoken about as my replacement at Florida State University. Uh, in 1907 to 1911, he was homeschooled um, and developed an interest in mathematical problems. 1913, they thought he had tuberculosis, and that was a mistake. They sent him away to a sanatorium. Perhaps that allowed him to uh, focus and develop some theories that he might not otherwise have developed. <coughs> he studied at a, a German um, school called the Gymnasium. Um, and he was uh, forced to, to take classes in Judaism. Unfortunately, or fortunately as the case may be, um, he eventually uh, converted to, uh, uh, I think he became a uh, Lutheran. Um, but there he met uh, John von Neumann, uh, excuse me, Stuart, von Neumann, is that right? Von Neumann, <laughs> thank you. Um, and uh, we've, we've talked about von Neumann. Um, they both had the uh, same math teacher, who I never heard of, uh, Laszlo Rotz. Um, in 1919, his family fled to Austria uh, to escape a communist regime. Guy, again, I never heard of, Bella Kuhn. In 1920, he uh, attended university wasn't very happy with the courses that were offered. So he switched to the Technical University of Berlin. Um, and there, of course, he met Einstein and as well as other luminaries such as Planck, uh, Heisenberg, 
Pauli, uh, and Zillar. Uh, some of whom we haven't spoken about. I'm going to keep them for future lectures. Um, he also um, met a guy named Paul Anyi, um, and uh, benefited from his teaching. Polanyi supervised Wigner's uh, thesis on the formation and decay of molecules. In 1939, um, he participated in a meeting that eventually led to the, the famous letter to Roosevelt um, from Einstein Zillard to initiate the Manhattan Project. Um, Wigner was afraid as were many others, that the German nuclear weapon project would develop an atomic bomb before the United States, before the Allies. During that uh, Manhattan Project team time, uh, he uh, led a team to design nuclear reactors to convert uranium into weapons-grade plutonium. Um, at the time, reactors existed only on paper, and no reactor had yet gone critical. Um, when we say critical, remember last week we spoke about how one neutron going into a uranium-238 uh, nucleus produces three neutrons. And if there's enough uranium around, then each of those three can produce three more. So it very rapidly expands, and each time that happens, of course, there's a release of energy. The thing about a nuclear reactor is it, it, it just board, it's just borderline critical. It's not uh, going to produce enough energy fast enough to explode, but it will produce a lot of heat. And of course, then if you have water circulating through the uh, heated area of the reactor, the core, then you can uh, drive a steam turbine and produce electrical energy. Um, in a bomb, of course, you, you don't remove the heat you, and you allow there to be sufficient uranium present so that there's a very fast release of energy and an explosion. Uh, it was pointed out last time, and I'll just emphasize what Dick said last time. In the Fukushima, uh, in the Chernobyl uh, incident, re uh, accident, uh, it wasn't a nuclear explosion. It was because there was a lot of hydrogen around, uh, that's what exploded. Now, it did produce a tremendous amount of fallout because you had all the radioactive material there, but it wasn't a nuclear explosion. Um, so, um, Wigner ended up uh, for a time at Oak Ridge. At that time, it was called the Clinton Laboratory. Um, and eventually, because he, he got frustrated with bureaucratic interference, he, uh, he left and returned to Princeton. He was present uh, when uh, the uh, when family tested the first atomic reactor, Chicago Pile 1, which unbeknownst, I'm sure, to the citizens of Chicago and the surrounding states, uh, the, uh, they tested the first atomic reactor, not really knowing what was going to happen. Fortunately, it didn't explode. Um, and they had the first controlled nuclear chain reaction <coughs> under uh, what it was called, it may still be called Stag Field, I'm not sure. And there's a, there's a plaque there uh, commemorating the event. I'm sorry? Grass really grows good there. Yeah, grass goes good there, yeah. Okay. 
and between 47 and 64, <clears throat> he uh, held a number of uh, positions with uh, government organizations and advisory capacity in, in some cases. In 1960, he published a, uh, his best known work of outside of his technical works called The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Mathematics in the Natural Sciences. It never ceases to amaze me that we have what we call physical constants, that, that we can actually depend upon the uh, gravitational constant, for example, uh, and the relationship between the four natural forces in the universe, the strong and weak nuclear force, the gravitational force, and the electrical force. If they didn't have the relationships they had, uh, they have, then the existence of atoms and molecules would not be possible. But the fact that we we know they're constants, and we, we uh, depend upon them and for our, our existence and the existence of everything in our universe is, to me, one of the greatest miracles that ever existed. <clears throat> in 61, he introduced the idea, and we'll talk more about this in detail, called Wigner's Friend, um, which, um, challenges the idea that there is an objective reality. And we're going to talk a lot more about that. Um, he, uh, he said that in, it seems that in contrast to classical physics, measurement results cannot be considered absolute truth, but it must be understood relative to the observer who performed the measurement. The stories we tell about quantum mechanics have to adapt to that. Much more about that when we get into the second part of the lecture after the timeline. He got the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1963 for his contributions to the theory of the atomic nucleus and elementary particles, particularly through the discovery and application of fundamental symmetry principles, and we're going to talk more about that. The prize was shared this year with two other people. Um, he also won a whole host of other awards, the Franklin Medal, the Fermi Award, the Adams for Peace Award, the Max Planck Medal, the National Medal of Science, the Einstein Award, and eventually the Wigner Medal. He died of pneumonia at uh, Princeton in 1995. Um, so, 93, right? He was born in 1902. His wife died much more recently in 2010. Presumably, his children are still alive. Okay, so this is a chart I made up. I take full responsibility for it. You won't see it anywhere else. <laughs> um, and what I tried to do here was illustrate the impediments to determining what is real, and the nature of reality. So the yellow bar in the middle represents reality, okay? And the green areas refer to uh, impediments that apply just about to everything. The orange areas to things that span uh, the world, the world, the universe, between objects that we can see and touch and objects at the quantum level. And the red area is primarily uh, involved with the quantum world, the world of micro-microscopic objects. 
So we're going to talk about each one of these in a little bit more detail um, so that you can appreciate uh, why I've put them up here and, and uh, organized them the way I have. So we know that light and sound have finite speeds. So if you see or hear an object or event, it does not accurately represent the current position or state of that object or event. For example, a calculation that I made is this. Suppose somebody is bouncing a ball, okay? If you are close enough to that person and object and event, then you will hear and see uh, the event occurring in synchronous time, okay? In other words, when you, when you hear the ball bounce, you'll see it bounce, okay? As you move further away, knowing that the speed of light is greater than the speed of sound, there will be a point in, uh, in terms of the distance away from that at which the sound will reach you a little bit later than the visual bounce. So you will see the bounce and then you will hear the bounce. Um, according to my calculation, if you get about 112.6 feet away from that occurrence, that object, that, that event, then your eye will not retain the image uh, that you've gotten so that there will be a, a dissonance between the uh, bounce and the observation of the bounce, the hearing of the bounce and the observation. Now your retina only retains an image for about a tenth of a second. So at 112.6 feet approximately, uh, the difference between the arrival of the light from that event and the sound from that event is about a tenth of a second. So that's where you start to get this asynchronous observation, where you will see the bounce and then you will hear it. And of course, the further away you are, the more pronounced that difference will be. Okay. Well, the nearest star to our sun is Proxima Centauri. Whoops, sorry. The nearest star to our sun is Proxima Centauri, about 4.3 light years away. A light year, of course, is a unit of distance, not time. When we look at that star, therefore, it appears as it was about 4.3 years ago. Some galaxies that we've identified are 13 plus billion light years away and of course may no longer exist simply because the lifetime of many stars is less than 13 billion years. The sun, for example, is about eight and a third light minutes from Earth, eight minutes and 20 seconds on average. So the sun appears to be where it was eight minutes and 20 seconds ago. That has some interesting implications, as I've mentioned before, for the Jewish calendar, where sunset is an important event, begins a new day. There was evening and there was morning the first day. So all Jewish holidays begin in the evening at sunset. Uh, I asked the rabbi, is, is it astronomical sunset? Or is it ob observational sunset? And the answer has been uniformly, it's observational. It doesn't matter when it really happens. It matters when you observe it. So after sunset, it belongs to the next day. Yeah, on the Jewish calendar, the day begins at sunset. Not at midnight. Not at midnight. No, not at midnight. No. Oh. And there was evening and there was morning. 
the first day. Okay, so that's one problem, right? Now there's another impediment to determining what is real. And I've shown you examples of this before. We know that light and sound are bent when, when the waves from those phenomena move from one uh, medium to another that may be more or less dense. So examples are, of course, uh, a uh, lens, okay, like the lens in your eye, uh, and going from air to water, the light beam is bent in this way toward the normal as it goes to a medium that is more dense. So the, uh, and of course the speed of light in water is slower than it is in air. And in air it's slower than it is in a vacuum. So another thing that affects the position of the sun is the fact that the light rays from the sun are bent when they enter the atmosphere of the earth. Okay? And this tends to make the sun appear above the horizon um, for a longer time than it actually is above the horizon. Again, it's observational when it comes to religious matters, but it's astro in astronomical terms, you're not seeing the time of actual sunset. Okay? And of course, when the sun is near the horizon, the light rays have to come through a much longer length of atmosphere than they do when the sun is high in the sky. So the bending is more pronounced, and since the refraction of light is different, the amount of the angle change is different for different frequencies of light, the sun appears redder near the horizon than it does when it's higher in the sky because red light is bent more than blue light, and blue light at the other end of the visible spectrum uh, is also subject to scattering in the sky, which gives us our blue sky. So again, we're not seeing what's actually happening. Well, we get to relativity. Three things about relativity, special relativity in particular, but also general relativity, are important. Time, distance, and mass are all relative, and they depend on the relative velocity of the observed and the observer. At low speeds, it doesn't make a whole lot of difference. So Newton and Newton's laws can be applied as long as the speed doesn't approach the speed of light. But as in this uh, equation, as V, the speed of an object relative to the observer, approaches the speed of light, one minus V squared over C squared gets to be a number very close to zero. If V equals C, then it would be one minus one, which is zero. Well, if you divide by a small number into a large, into a, a fixed number, if you divide any number by a very, very small number, you get a very, very large number. So time interval approaches infinity, right? Which means time stands still as V approaches C. Mass becomes very large as V approaches C. And we've, uh, we've been able to accelerate electrons, for example, in an accelerator uh, up to about 95, 96% the speed of light. And, and then let them hit something and measure their momentum, which in effect measures their mass. Since we know their speed, we can determine their mass. And indeed, the mass does increase. Mass is a form of energy, okay? Mass is a very efficient way of storing energy. 
And again, uh, distance, the measurement of distance. Just think about this for a minute. Supposing you're standing on the side of a railroad track and the train starts to move. Now, if you are equal distance from the front and back of the train, they will appear to start moving at the same time. But, let's say you're standing near the front of the train. The front of the train will appear to move very, very slightly before the rear of the train, which means the train is elongated. <laughs> right? And if one end starts to move and the other hasn't moved, the train is, if you measured it, if you could measure it with any degree of accuracy, because the difference is very slight, the train is slightly longer than it in fact is. Okay, so distance is in effect a special relativity. What happens as the speed of an object increases, this is called the Lorentz contraction. Okay, so as it goes faster and faster, if you measured its length, you would get a shorter and shorter measurement as it got faster and faster. Again, an impediment to determining what's real. So at 80% of the speed of light, 1 minus v squared over c squared is equal to about 0.6. And the square root of that is uh, five, 1 over 0. 0.6 is 5 thirds, okay? Or about 1.67. So at 80% of the speed of light, it appears to an observer looking at a clock that's moving that one second would be about 1.67 seconds. Mass would increase to about 1.67 kilograms for every one kilogram of mass. Kilograms about 2.2 pounds. And one meter would be measured as six tenths of a meter. So that second equation must be what? A third equation. No, it's 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 a reduction rather than an increase, right? Well, if you divide it by 0.6, you're going to get 1.6. Okay, fine. Right. The there is a contraction. I, I have it right in the text. Oh, oh the equation. Okay. Yeah, okay. I, I moved the prime, yeah. Okay. You mean I was right, Stuart? Correct. Oh, wow. That's the first time he's ever said that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Superposition. We've talked about that. And Schrodinger's cat was this thought experiment created by the uh, Austrian physicist Erwin Schrodinger in 1935. So imagine a cat placed in a sealed box. There's a bottle of poison that is opened when a Geiger counter is triggered by the decay of a radioactive sample. Now, radioactive decay is a random process. So the trigger could have a 50% chance of one atom decaying within an hour, releasing the poison and killing the cat. Therefore, after an hour, it is impossible to know, without opening the box, both whether the radioactive atom has decayed or not, and consequently whether the cat is either dead or alive. Quantum theory seems to allow for both states to exist at once with the atom and the cat existing in a so-called superposition of both possible states. It is only when the system is measured, for example, by opening the box and seeing the fate of the cat, that the superposition collapses and one outcome is fixed. Dr. Schrodinger had proposed a thought experiment to show the paradoxical nature of superposition when considered on a larger non-quantum scale. He had not truly intended for the dead and alive cat to be taken as a serious possibility. Nevertheless, the idea of Schrodinger's cat persists 
as a popular way to consider different interpretations of quantum theory. I'm going to apologize for showing this video now because some of you have seen it, but some of you have not. And the thing to keep in mind when you see this video is that there is some relationship between consciousness and conscious observation and what happens, what you are observing. And here we are, the granddaddy of all quantum weirdness, the infamous double slit experiment. To understand this experiment, we first need to see how particles or little balls of matter act. If we randomly shoot a small object, say a marble, at the screen, we see a pattern on the back wall where they went through the slit and hit. Now, if we add a second slit, we would expect to see a second band duplicated to the right. Now, let's look at waves. The waves hit the slit and radiate out striking the back wall with the most intensity directly in line with the slit. The line of brightness on the back screen shows that intensity. This is similar to the line the marbles make. But when we add the second slit, something different happens. If the top of one wave meets the bottom of another wave, they cancel each other out. So now, there is an interference pattern on the back wall. Places where the two tops meet are the highest intensity, the bright lines, and where they cancel, there is nothing. So, when we throw things, that is, matter, through two slits, we get this, two bands of hits. And with waves, we get an interference pattern of many bands. Good so far. Now, let's go quantum. An electron is a tiny, tiny bit of matter, like a tiny marble. Let's fire a stream through one slit. It behaves just like the marble, a single band. So, if we shoot these tiny bits through two slits, we should get, like the marbles, two bands. What? An interference pattern. We fired electrons, tiny bits of matter through. But we get a pattern like waves, not like little marbles. How? How could pieces of matter create an interference pattern like a wave? It doesn't make sense. But physicists are clever. They thought, maybe those little balls are bouncing off each other and creating that pattern. So, they decide to shoot electrons through one at a time. There is no way they could interfere with each other. <coughs> but after an hour of this, the same interference pattern is seen to emerge. The conclusion is inescapable. The single electron leaves as a particle, becomes a wave of potentials, goes through both slits and interferes with itself to hit the wall like a particle. But mathematically, it's even stranger. It goes through both slits and it goes through neither. And it goes through just one and it goes through just the other. All of these possibilities are in superposition with each other. But physicists were completely baffled by this. So they decided to peek and see which slit actually goes through. They put a measuring device by one slit to see which one it went through and let it fly. <laughs> but the quantum world is far more mysterious than they could have imagined. When they observed, the electron went back to behaving like a little marble. It produced a pattern of two bands, not an interference pattern of many. The very act of measuring or observing which slit it went through meant it only went through one, not both. 
the electron decided to act differently, as though it was aware it was being watched. And it was here that physicists stepped forever into the strange never world of quantum events. What is matter? Marbles or waves? And waves of what? And what does an observer have to do with any of this? The observer collapsed the wave function simply by observing. The fascinating thing is that when they moved the counting device, the observation, to the other side of the slits, the electron actually went back and changed its behavior. In other words, it went back in time so that you got the same result. It didn't matter where you, when you observed. You could observe before it went through the slit or after it went through the slit. The electron knew, hey, you ain't gonna fool me. I'll go back and change my behavior if you observe after the slit so that when I come through the slit, I come through as a particle. But the important thing is, I think, that I'd like to glean from this for you, is that the mere act of observation changed the result. The act of observation changed the result. How did they actually do the measurement? They tried all different kinds of methods. They tried to fool the electron in every possible way. They tried to do secondary observations, tertiary observations with circuitry. But physically, how did they actually do it? In a variety of ways. How do you observe, how do you, how do you detect an electron? It's a change in a magnetic field, okay? So that's one way to do it. But there are all different kinds of ways you can do it. Yeah, yeah. What's they put, what's they put a probe in that? I'm wondering if they put anything in there that wasn't observing it or just an object who was interfering with right. the path, whether they saw that change. Well, they couldn't, they couldn't interfere with the path of the electron because it did hit the, it hit the screen. Yeah, but after it came out, it, it was uh, disturbed. Yeah, yeah. The waves, uh, something, something was affecting it. Okay, something was affecting it. So, objective observation. And here we come back to Wigner. He, he came up with a thought experiment, something similar to what Einstein did all the time, uh, in theoretical quantum physics. This was in 1961. So he said that if you have an observer, okay, who is doing a measurement on a quantum system, then there's a 50% chance, let's say, if he's looking at the spin of an electron, that it could be up or down, it could be a one or a zero, okay? So he can get either a one or a zero, 50% either way. But the question is, what if you have an observer called Wigner's friend, okay, who then tells Wigner what he observed? Okay, is Wigner now making an observation of what the spin is? Is it a one or a zero? In other words, the mere transmission of knowledge of a, of a measurement is equivalent to making a measurement. But there's a probability that Wigner will also have a 50% chance up or down. So there's a possibility that the two observations will disagree. So the resulting statements of the two observers contradict each other. And this reflects a seeming incompatibility of two laws in quantum theory. 
Is it probabilistic or is it deterministic? Is it predetermined so that whatever happens, happens and that's it? Or is there a probability that one observer could get a different result from the other observer? So there's a measurement problem in quantum mechanics. I thought of a different uh, uh, approach or way of describing this. Supposing you had two observers looking at Schrodinger's cat, okay? At the same time, okay? Now there's a 50% probability for each observer that the cat will be alive. Therefore, 50% that the cat could be dead. Well, one observer might get the cat alive and the other dead. The other uh, example I thought of was this. You have a moving train car, okay? In the center of the train car, equidistant from each end of the train car, you have a device is set up such that it will fire a bullet into a cat, okay, killing the cat. And it's set up so that the gun will go off if light, a light ray, which starts at the center of the car and is reflected from each end, gets back to the center at exactly the same time. Okay, so you're on the car, you, uh, turn on the light, it's reflected back, they get, it gets there at the same time, the gun goes off. Fine, for the guy on the car, the cat's dead. What about for a guy standing by the side of the track? The guy standing by the side of the track would not see the light reach the center of the car at the same time. The gun would not go off, the cat would be alive. All right, Dick, I know you want to say something. Yeah, I'm thinking. thinking, okay. Is it stationary or is it stationary? So, so depending on the observer, the cat is either dead or alive. And they contradict. They contradict. By the way, this, this book explores this seeming paradox. Baxter's Time Like Infinity. Fascinating story. So, Wigner's friend is a thought experiment, and this friend of Wigner's lets him perform a quantum measurement on a physical system, okay? It could be a spin of an electron, or it could be Schrodinger's cat. It's in a superposition of two distinct states. Zero or one, dead or alive. Wigner's friend measures the system, and then he'll get one of two possible outcomes. And the system will then collapse. The wave function will collapse, as we saw in the electron experiment, in the video. Now, Wigner himself models a scenario from outside the laboratory knowing that inside his friend will at some point perform that measurement. So Wigner will assign some kind of superposition state to the whole laboratory, okay? And Wigner will now ask his friend what he had obtained and assign some state to the system. But the question is, when did the measurement occur? Did it occur when Wigner's friend made the measurement for both of them? Or did it occur at different times for Wigner and his friend? Does measurement occur when you get the information? Or did it occur even without getting the information when his friend made the measurement? In other words, what is the relationship of consciousness to reality? As we saw in the video, 
the electron knew. Now the electron is an inanimate object, but it knew when it was being observed. How could that be? How could an inanimate object know something? There's another problem. We used to think that electrons were in fixed orbits around the nucleus of an atom. Now we say that the electrons are in orbitals, not orbits. And that there is only a certain probability that a given electron is in a certain place at a certain time. What Feynman called a cloud of electrons. So we don't know where an electron is exactly at any given time. We only can assign a certain probability to its location. Then we get to symmetry, okay? And this is something that Wigner addressed at some length. So it's called CPT, okay? So C stands for charge, okay? We know that there are electrons, which are called positrons, that have a charge that is opposite that of the typical electron. So an electron with a positive charge is called a positron. There is a symmetry in the universe of electrons. There are positive electrons and negative electrons. P is parity, okay, spin. Electrons can spin up or down. There's a symmetry again. And T stands for time. Okay, so if an electron has a certain momentum and it's reflected by an arbitrary object or plane, it can have the opposite momentum. Momentum is conserved. So momentum can be in this direction or in this direction. It can be up or down, but it's conserved. To preserve this symmetry, okay, there you can you cannot violate, okay, uh, any one of them, okay, uh, any two of them, without having a corresponding violation in the third. Well, you might be thinking this is you see where this is leading. If there is this symmetry in the universe, this is what eventually led to the idea of another universe or of multiple universes. If there is true symmetry, then for every electron in our universe, there should be an a positron in a universe of antimatter with the opposite momentum. Oh, there's the slide now. Now the now the video is going to play the way it should have. Let me see if I can get past it. There we go. Okay, I had it in the wrong place. Okay. Consciousness affects reality. Okay, I've seen all these all these impediments to determining reality. You really don't know at any given time where something is, when it was there, okay? Even what its true color is, okay? And now you're not even sure which state it's in, if there are two possible states. But, but aside from all that, the mere fact of observing something could change it. 
Okay. So if you don't observe it, it's in one state, but when you observe it, it changes. Okay. It's sort of like Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. When you try to measure something, then something else changes about that particular object. Princeton did a uh, series of experiments. They got about 300 people together and they all observed a computer screen. And the images on the screen were flipping back and forth between an astronaut and a leopard. Okay, you got the picture? The beginning of the experiment involved the transition of the images at random at various time intervals. So you might see the leopard for a few seconds and then a quick look at the astronaut, then the leopard for one second, then the astronaut for five seconds. You know, it was varying. Then the researchers inquired to the audience what image was preferable, to which most responded the astronaut. After that, they were instructed to concentrate only on seeing the astronaut. The images continued to be random for a short time after these instructions were given. There was no effect. Then, the image of the astronaut was the only one that appeared until the experiment was concluded. The mere fact of preferring one image over another changed the algorithm that was throwing up these images on the screen. And to many, this leads to the belief that random events can be altered with conscious influence. There's a lotto tonight, a lotto tonight. I'm gonna try this out. <laughs> what was the algorithm, or what was, how were they were randomizing it? No, I had a computer, I'm sure. Well, so you're saying the observation changed the computers? We've yet to find a, I've never seen an algorithm that was truly random. That's right. Okay. So I'm not, there's, right there's, there's no such thing as producing a random algorithm. Yeah, okay. okay. Right granted, granted, but it's still unusual that it got rid of the leopard. It's weird. It's weird. It is weird. Yep. What's the matter now? There we go. Now we have to talk a little bit about entropy, which is a tendency of a system to tend toward disorganization. Okay? Energy of any other form is eventually translated into heat, and heat is basically the movement of repeated collisions of molecules, and systems tend to be disorganized as time progresses. So this creates noise, okay? So noise and entropy are related. And we've already talked about the signal to noise ratio when, when I lectured on Shannon, if you recall that, if you were here. What we find is that no computer hardware can print a software output with 100% infallibility. There's always a bug somewhere. Quantum fluctuations in the circuit can occur with some randomness. So occasionally a one will be misrepresented as a zero or vice versa. And there's no way to prevent it. As Shannon proved with his noiseless channel theorem, employment of error correction codes can drastically reduce the transmission of errors, but only in the ideal case can we have a noise-free channel. There's always gonna be some noise. You know, if you're in a crowded room and you're trying to have a conversation and the noise level is 80 or 90 dBs, you know, very noisy, you miss words, you miss words. And you're missing it because the noise level is high compared to the signal level. 
and other impediment to determining reality. The noise in circuits, the noise in systems. Okay? There's always going to be some noise. So this is kind of interesting. I forgot to bolden this, so I'll read it to you. The sum of reality is a series of bits embedded in a human brain to represent a total view or experience. Because what you see and what you hear, everything you sense, is eventually reduced to an electric or magnetic field in your brain. So reality is information. Eventually, that's what it's reduced to. Everything you are seeing and hearing right now is causing electromagnetic operations in your brain. Are those bits merely a way to describe reality, or are they fundamental to reality itself? Many believe they're fundamental. Is the universe a gigantic computer, flipping bits to reach some physical conclusion? <clears throat> there are two to the 300 power particles in the universe. It would be possible to give each one of those a unique barcode consisting of 300 bits. Okay? We could represent every particle in the universe with a comparably small sequence of bits. Are we living in a simulation that presents itself as reality and is created and controlled <coughs> by a 300 bit string? Some actually, people actually believe that. I'm sorry? Some people do actually believe that. Yes. I heard oh, yes. Someone on an interview on a radio show and oh, yes. strongly believe that they actually believe that. Have you ever seen the Matrix movie? Oh, well, that's cool. Years ago. You know, all Matrix movies. Well, is reality a simulation? The strongest argument for us being in a simulation, probably being in a simulation, is the following. Forty years ago, we had a, a computer game called Pong. Two rectangles and a dot. That's what games were. They were very simple. Now, 40 years later, we have photorealistic 3D simulations with millions of people playing simultaneously. And it's getting better every year, more complex. Soon we'll have virtual reality, augmented reality. If you assume any rate of improvement at all, the games will eventually become indistinguishable from reality. <laughs> Let's hope it proves it. It's a great game maker in sun. That's right. Here's some additional indications of simulated reality. We have large numbers of people addicted to looking at computerized screens. I go I go to New Jersey to visit my grandchildren. <laughs> Most of the time <laughs> they're looking at their screens. We don't even have opportunity to talk. Truth is defined by what is disseminated <coughs> on the internet. There's a difficulty in distinguishing between virtual reality and actual reality. There's a greater reliance on non-human beings, Siri, Alexa, Roomba, robots. And there's a widespread availability of realistic games. So in summary, it is not possible with total precision to determine the location, time of occurrence, velocity, or other characteristics of any event or object. The nature of reality is blurry, unpredictable, uncertain, and different for each observer. And may be affected by the mere fact of observation, as you saw. In the fifth century, St. Augustine of Hippo wrote, 
that the universe was created with time and not in time. In other words, the creation of the universe was also the creation of time. There was no time before the creation of the universe. The origin of our universe and the origin of time and laws and constants of physics was simultaneous due to quantum fluctuations that could have been replicated with different results multiple times, yielding multiple universes, each with different laws and constants of physics. Black holes, maybe, and here I was speculating, where our universe's laws of physics break down and where information may disappear may be openings to other universes with different laws of physics and different realities, although they would be equally unknowable with precision or predictability. We may be living in a simulated universe. Wadsworth Longfellow wrote, Tell me not in mournful numbers life is but an empty dream, or the soul is dead that slumbers, and things are not what they seem. Wow. Wow. What a great lecture. Thank you. I hope I've given you something to think about. Yeah. It's uh, a struggle to determine what is real. Have a good week. I'll see you next week.